So the outline for today, if we can go to the next slide, <clears throat> we're going to talk about very, uh, as much as we can, three points. Because there are certain things when you look at, uh, you know, the biographies of different people, you'll notice that they're obviously everything about their life, especially someone um, as significant as her, everything is important, but there are certain parts of their story that stand out. And we can glean so many lessons from those aspects of, of their story. So um, we're going to just briefly touch upon her birth and marriage, which of course uh, she, mashallah, we know who she is. But then we're going to really spend a lot of time talking about the controversy um, around her, and I'll, sp I'll be more specific. And then we'll go into the legacy that she left. So it is a bit information heavy, but you know this was the purpose, inshallah, that we all uh, learn more and and from from one another. So I hope um, you're ready to take some notes and uh, inshallah learn. So Bismillah. With that said, uh, we'll go to um, the slide that says birth and marriage with the one. So yes, right here, Bismillah. So th these are just some biographical quick points that we should all know about her: her birth year. Her parents, of course, said Abu Bakr uh, uh, as Siddiq and Um Rahman, anhum. Her siblings, Asma and Abdurrahman bin Abi Bakr. And then, you know, the date of her marriage. And uh, that came, uh, there's difference of opinion on exactly what year, but we know that she was the third wife of the Prophet, and that he saw a very significant and beautiful dream where she was wrapped in green silk presented by uh, the angel to the Prophet, foreshadowing that she would be. Uh, his wife, or for telling him that she would be his wife. Um, and then she had beautiful nicknames that uh, he had given her. Um, one of them was Um Abdullah. Uh, that might confuse people because she didn't have children of her own, but she wanted to have a kunya, as was the custom of the people. And so uh, Abdullah was her nephew. It was the son of Asma. So that was her uh, one of her names. She was also addressed as Humaira, right? The red-faced one, mashallah, because she would blush often. So we know that she was fair-skinned. And then a really other sweet uh, nickname that the Prophet ﷺ gave her was Aish, right? So instead of Aisha, he referred to in that cute way as Aish. And there's a hadith, if we go to the next slide, where um, the Prophet ﷺ once uh, said that, told her that Jibreel ﷺ was was giving her salam, but he called her by this specific nickname, and it's in the hadith. So it's really significant. I mean, we can tell, obviously, their relationship, and when you read about their relationship, it was one of, of love, of, of, um, of great uh, you know, harmony and, and beauty. Their rapport with each other was so sweet and tender, and she, uh, you know, in her hadith, because most of the hadith that we have about their relationship come from her, you can just tell this was an absolutely a love marriage. But it's also revealed in these exchanges that they had with each other. And there's so much, as I said, content and so much uh, about her marriage and her relationship with the Prophet ﷺ. And I think all of us can independently study those, those stories and those moments of their life together. Um, but I would like to now um, just highlight some hadith where the Prophet ﷺ again is reminding us of his love for her so that we know who she is and you know and, and we we realize that how significant she is here the Prophet ﷺ says that the superiority of Aisha over other women is like the superiority of Thadid to other meals Thadid was a meal that was very um, beloved to the Arabs so he was basically saying that that's how you know great she is just as that meal everybody craves and wants that's how she is that's one hadith again many many but here's another one where Amr ibn al-As actually asked the Prophet who his beloved was and he first says her so that is really significant I mean, of all the people all the great Sahaba every single person in the Prophet's orbit he is talking about her, that she is the most beloved to him. And then he was, you know, a lot of the Sahaba, when they would ask these questions of the Prophet said it because he had the power of making everyone feel loved, right? That was one of his many, of many, many virtues, is that if you were in his company, you felt like you were the most important person to him. So there are really many hadith where some of the Sahaba would ask him because they were like, yes, I'm going to be number one on the list. <laughs> and there's another funny one. I, I don't remember who the Sahabi was, but... 
it, the brothers kept naming all these other people. And at a certain point, he was like, okay, I, I'm done <laughs> because he wasn't on the list. But of course, you know, mashallah, he was. It just, he wasn't where he thought he was. But that speaks to the power of being able to really uh, hold space with people with that type of emotional intelligence that they feel loved by you. Even if your heart, you know, is divided in other areas that we learn from the Prophet ﷺ that everybody should be treated with that level of respect and significance and validation and care that when they walk away from you, that they feel really loved by you, right? And that was one of his many, many virtues. But um, then he proceeded and he asked who from the men and the Prophet ﷺ said her father, Abu Bakr as -Sidhi. So again, we can see her lineage. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He, we know that he was the most beloved of the, uh, of the companions to the Prophet ﷺ. And his daughter was the most beloved person to him, subhanAllah. So <clears throat> now, and this is really what I wanted to focus the talk on because it's such a significant story and it's so powerful. Um, honestly, if you read this story and uh, you hear, we have many great scholars. I, I know uh, Sheikh Omar Suleiman just recently did, a, I think, a three or four part series on her biography we have uh, Sheikh Hamza, mashallah, has uh, the first time I ever heard her story was from him many years ago. It was incredible. It completely moved my heart. And then Sheikh Yasir Qadi. So many of our scholars have spent a great deal of time unpacking this story because of the powerful lessons that apply to all of us. And so there's significance to why some of the great people of our of the world uh, have been tested in such hard ways, which we'll get into. But if you're not familiar with this, this is called Hadith al-Ifq, which is the scandal or the controversy. And so let's let's explore what this is. And we go to the next slide. So the Prophet said that whenever he would travel, he would draw lots between, so that you know he would choose from, from the lots who of his wives he would take with them. And if it was an expedition, like a military expedition, he would only take them, uh, because obviously for safeguarding reasons, if he knew that this was going to be a victorious expedition. So he had known, they had the, if you know the backstory of this particular one, uh, which is Bani al Mustal Mus Mus sorry. Uh, if you know the backstory of it, um, the way that it planned out, there was signs that the Muslims were going to be victorious the way that it all happened. So that's why he was willing to take her. But she basically, her name came up. And at that time, the verse of hijab was revealed. So the wives of the Prophet, they, the, the hijab verses apply to the general masses about, you know, the, the way that we present ourselves. And we know that the women of that time, they all veiled, but they didn't draw their khimar over their chests, which is what the verses were teaching that they would take their, their veiling to the next level and actually cover all of their aura. But when it came to the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, it actually was more than that. It was that they had to be in a barrier. So when they would travel, they would have these little mini tents called haudaj that were placed upon the camel, and the wives were hidden in those. And that's how they traveled, and you know they were protected and guarded. So she, uh, she was placed there, and she... they. She, you know, they, she went along with it. And the expedition, alhamdulillah, was successful. The Muslims were victorious. So now they're on their way back. And a lot of the, this, by the way, expedition was also very unique because it was the one with the most munafiqeen were with, with the companions. So there was a very mixed bag of people there, let's just say. And there were a lot of controversies that happened during this particular uh, ghazwa. But... Um, <clears throat> So uh, the, the Sahaba were tired, they were exhausted, there were certain events that had unfolded. So some of them wanted to go back to Medina. This was in the out, like kind of the outskirts of Medina. So they wanted to go back. Um, and, uh, and so what happened was they were told to camp overnight near uh, the, the, uh, where the battle had taken place outside of Medina just to get some rest. Um, and then at that time, uh, said Aisha, she was, you know, Camping when she walked, she went to go relieve herself, and when she came back, she felt her necklace. She she touched, you know, she went to go touch her her chest, and she felt that her necklace was missing. And this was a very significant necklace. It was something that her mother had given to her. Uh, some of the uh, hadith say that it was made from um, a Yemeni bead that was black and white, referred to as zafar, and others say that it was made of onyx. So this was not gold. It was not, you know, something that would we would say was of value per se, but it was valuable to her because who gifted it to her? 
So she went into panic mode, right? Like this is such an important necklace. So she, subhanAllah, and you just imagine she's a teenager. You know, she's uh, very innocent. She goes out wondering, where did I leave this? She goes so far for so long trying to trace her steps, look for where this necklace is, that by the time that all that was going on, because some of the Sahaba were getting tired, they were, the Prophet then had, you know, proceeded to tell them to pick up and go. So they were able to pack it all up and actually head back towards Medina while she's still looking for her necklace. So she comes back shocked that there's nobody there. And, you know, what does she do? So again, in her innocence, she thinks, well, they'll probably notice that I'm gone. And if I just stay put, they'll come back and get me. So she decides to stay put, and then subhanAllah, fatigue overcomes her, so she falls asleep. And she's sleeping, and at that point, she's not, she didn't have her face covered. She's by herself. So she's just resting. And all of a sudden, there was another Sahabi, um, Safwan ibn Mu'atal as-Sulami. He missed the, the call that everybody was going to pack up and go again. He fell asleep during that time. So he wakes up, and he's like, oh, I guess they all proceeded forth. So he decides to get going when he comes across a figure lying. And because he had seen her before the verse of hijab was revealed, he immediately knew who she was. And the only word he said was, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Okay? He felt the gravity of the situation, and he said this in that moment to, to such a degree that it woke her up. And remember, if you read the actual hadith from Sahih al-Bukhari al-Muslim, I say that Aisha, 50 years or so after this incident, is recalling everything with incredible detail. So she is the one narrating this hadith, and she says that, Wallahi, by Allah, he didn't say a word to me other than that. He didn't even look at me. All he did was he lowered his camel, turned around so that I could get on it, and then he walked and took her. They didn't exchange words. There was nothing said, and he took her safely. Now, what happened was, if we go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> they caught up to the army that had preceded them, now, remember, this is kind of like a caravan. So you want to imagine this, visualize this. This is a caravan of camels and a lot of people walking. At the back end of this caravan is who? Other than the hypocrite, they call him the snakehead of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay ibn Salud. Now, he sees these two together. And I want you to, again, think of this. He's a hypocrite. He does not believe. He sees an opportunity. And he decides... This is fishy. The wife of the messenger of Allah, you know, or who thinks he is, because remember, he's a hypocrite, he doesn't believe, is with another strange man, and they're all the way behind the rest of the caravan. So he decides in that moment to, I mean, the rumor, you know, it begins to spread, but it comes from him. Now, the question is, why would he do that? He's a hypocrite, so we can... We can, you know, assume certain things, but there's actually an entire backstory. And um, I wanted to really give you the, the full context of what we're dealing with here because they hit, they went so low in trying to take down the Prophet and the Muslims that they were willing to uh, cast aspersions and, and, you know, start all these rumors about the, the wife of the Messenger of Allah. But why? So the backstory is really interesting. The, um, just before this incident, during Bani al-Mustalliq, uh, the, the, the Ghazwa, there was another major incident that happened, which is Surah Al-Munafiqun was revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Surah of the first two verses actually paraphrases the very words that were said by Abdullah uh, bin um, Salul. No, Ubay. Abdullah bin Ubay. So he, the verses are right there. So th these verses are actually paraphrasing words that he said. Now, what's that backstory? Like, why, you know, to be, you know, in the Quran mentioned as a hypocrite, revealed in this way for everybody. And everybody knew that this was about him. 
So he is angry. He is fuming. He is enraged that the surah was about him and people are speaking about him in this way. So that's why when he sees the situation, he's like, hmm, you know, he gets all these ideas. But why was the surah revealed? So this is another part of the story. So during the ghazwa, two, uh, two young men, one from the Ansar and one from the Muhajirin, were sent to go get water. When they went to go get water, they started having a scuffle, a fight. It actually got really physical, and they ended up beating each other up. But in the course of them fighting with each other, they called who? Their tribes. So they called the Ansar and the Muhajirin to come and defend them. So both of these groups are now at odds with each other. Remember I mentioned that this Ghazwa had more Munafiqun than any other. So they were there, and they don't, you know, they're not looking to try to build bridges and bond. They wanted this type of fighting and, and, and tribalism to happen. So they take their sides and they start warring with each other, fighting, ready to fight, drawing their weapons. And the Prophet of course, hears of this and he comes out and he is upset. And he actually tells them, have, has the days of Jahariya come and, and you're, you're back there? And he gets so upset that he actually tells them, he says this is ignorance and filthy. He refers to what they're doing as filthy. And the word he uses is muntiha. And he says, you know, stop this. And that was it. There was no inquiry. There was no, let's, you know, like hash it out. It was, this is wrong. Stop it right now. And that's it. And as soon as that happened, Abdullah bin Ubay, because he was the head of the Munafiqeen and he saw this as an opportunity to cause more division, he's angry at how it was handled. It wasn't satisfying enough. He wanted the fight. He wanted there to be all of this animosity in the heart. So he goes back to his tent gathers some of his little henchmen with him and he's speaking to them really angrily like this is all your fault if you hadn't w welcomed these uh you know muhajirin opened your uh, homes to them given them food and supported them we wouldn't have all these problems you did this so he's really angry what he doesn't realize is someone sitting in his company named who zaid ibn arqam if we can go to the next slide so zaid ibn arqam was there and he's a believer so he's sitting there listening going what is this man talking about? He's completely inciting all of these people against the Muslims, against the Prophet ﷺ. He's speaking really in low terms. So he's very upset and he feels compelled to go to report to his uncle. His uncle then takes him to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is, calls Abdullah bin Ubay. Like, I, is this true? Are you in a tent inciting brothers against one another and against the Muslims? And of course, he's a hypocrite. So what does he do? No, no, of course not. <laughs> Me? I would never. Complete denial. Now, the Prophet said, um, accepted his testimony in that moment. For, and he has obviously hikmah. We don't know. We, don't, we, we can't access that. Or we don't have that level of understanding. But he knew what he was doing. So he accepted it. Zaid, unfortunately, because he thinks like, oh my God, the Prophet is accepting his testimony over mine, his heart is shattered. And he says, it was the worst day of my life. Like the Prophet doesn't believe me and he believes him. But he doesn't understand that the Prophet knows, right? He knows things. The next morning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vindicated who? Zaid, because Surah Al-Munafiqun was revealed. So now, Zaid says, um, and it's a really beautiful uh, part of the story. I don't think I have it in the slides, but um, in the hadith, it says that Zaid said the Prophet took him by the ear, you know, and, and he, he comforted him and told him that he was vindicated by the surah being revealed. So he said that it was like the best day of his life, you know. So subhanAllah, Allah knows. But now back to the story. So that's why Abdullah bin Ubay was so angry. He wanted to get revenge, and he saw a perfect opportunity. I'm angry, I'm humiliated, everybody thinks I'm a hypocrite. He was, but he didn't like that being revealed. Now I have an opportunity to take down, because if I can get everybody to doubt the wife of this man, then it all falls apart. So he had this whole plot, and he decides to spread these rumors. Now, Aisha, said Aisha radiallahu anha, independent of all of this that's going on, she became ill. She became very ill thing she was like so sick fever everything for one month she's sick and all of this controversy is spreading it's spreading to the hypocrites obviously they love it it's spreading to even some of the believers who are kind of like 
oh, they don't know what to do with this information because it's so compelling. Maybe there's truth to it, maybe there's not. They love the Prophet ﷺ, they don't know what to do. So there's all this division happening. She has no idea because she's bedridden, sick, completely out of it. And then one day, um, she, uh, she also, though, is picking up on certain things. One of the things she's picking up on is that the Prophet Sallallahu isn't as warm to her as he usually was. When he would come to check on her, he, he was always very loving, but now he's a little emotionally removed. So she's beginning to think something's wrong, but she doesn't know what. There's no idea these rumors are being spread. And so she's just kind of, you know, picking up things. But the next thing, event that happens is they had to, at that time, you know, they didn't have, you know, places to relieve themselves close. So they would go far to do that. So she ended up going with her uh, second cousin, the cousin of her father, um, Abu Bakr Siddiq, named Umm Mista. So they basically go to use the restroom. And on their way back, she trips over, Umm Mista trips over her skirt. So when she trips over her skirt in her state, she just says, curse my son. And, you know, a mother saying that to, about her son. So I just, like, has no idea what's going on. And she says, why, why would you say that about your son? How could you say that about him? Again, not knowing, why Mista? Why, why would her mother say this? Mista was one of the people, unfortunately, embroiled in the gossip. He was embroiled in it. So she says to Aisha, if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> my dear child, don't you know what is going on? Don't you know what is being said? She's completely like, she doesn't know that she doesn't know. And now she has to tell her. So when she told her, some of the uh, reports say that she was so grief-stricken and horrified, mortified, that she actually fainted, right? Because to imagine you're a pure woman and then these horrible rumors are being spread about you. And she's also young. We have to keep in mind she's a teenager, right? So she's very mature for her age, but she's... She doesn't have all this life experience with these things. So for her, it's like, oh, you know, she can't believe it. She's in shock and she actually faints. And then she returns home and she's in such a state of shock. She doesn't want to, you know, reveal her state of shock to the Prophet, but she wants to investigate. She needs to know what is being said and how, is this true? Like, am, is, is this true? So she asked the Prophet, can I go to my parents? Can I stay with them? He says, yes. So he lets her go. She goes and she asks her mother, like, is this true? What, is it? what are these rumors? And her mother confirms them. But she tries to console her. It's just not good enough for, for Sayyidah Aisha. She's, she's so heartbroken. She cannot believe again that these things are being said about her. So she, she goes and she basically, she says, these are her words. If we go to the next slide, she says, I cried and I cried until the morning came and my tears would not stop and I did not taste the sweetness of sleep. She spent that whole night crying, not sleeping for even a moment because this is her life, this is her, her you know, name, her reputation, everything. She can't believe it. Now, who are the people that are involved in this rumor mongering that's going on? We talked about Abdullah ibn Ubay, but he had other people, Mista, which was her second cousin, there's also Hamana bin Jahish. Now, this is interesting too. Zainab bin Jahish was, was, was the Prophet's wife as well. So, Hamana is her sister. And of all of the wives of the Prophet, Zainab was the closest in terms of rivalry. She was young, she was beautiful. She had, you know, there was some competition basically there between her and Sayyid Aisha. And Hamana, thinking that she's, you know, looking out for her sister, decides to add fuel to this fire. Um, you know, for her own motives, unfortunately. And then Hassan ibn Thabit. Now, there are others that were also, th so those are the people who were embroiled in the gossip. There were others who defended when they heard about this, they were like, no way. Uh, um, Us Osama bin Zaid was one of them. The Prophet Sallallahu actually asked him if he saw anything ever suspicious. He was like, absolutely not. You know, this was the son of Zaid. And then Ali radiallahu anh said, Ali radiallahu anh, he's kind of has a very vague answer um, because, again, we have to keep in mind when you don't know all the answers, you know, some people uh, rely on their convictions. Other people rely on, you know, being neutral. So he was kind of neutral and he was more interested in 
seeking to protect the Prophet ﷺ. So he just says to the Prophet ﷺ, why don't you ask Barira, you know, who was, um, a, uh, she was actually uh, freed by Sayyid Aisha. She was a slave. She was freed by her. But she opted because she loved Sayyid Aisha so much. She wanted to be her maidservant. So she still, you know, served her in that way as a free woman. But she loved her. And she said, absolutely not. So she completely confessed her innocence. She said, the only thing I've ever seen her do is she would fall asleep when she was kneading dough. And then the goats would come and eat the dough. That's all I can complain about her. That's it. But nothing else that would be this, you know, to, to say, indicate her character had any flaw. So they came to her defense. And Sayyidah Aisha, of course, you know, is hearing all of these things, but the pain is so overwhelming to her that she just continued to cry. She became actually more violently sick after this rumor was shared with her. She was already sick for a month, but now she became violently sick. And she said, I continued to cry that day and my tears would not stop until I thought my liver would burst open. SubhanAllah. And also... Um, I mean, this is a really beautiful point, and I brought it up just because I think it's a really great model of how we share space with people who are going through things that we cannot understand. One of the women of the Ansar just came, asked permission to enter, and all she did was sit and cry with her. So sometimes that's what people need. They don't need lessons and lectures and advice given to them when they're falling apart. They just need you to tell them I am so sorry that you're going through this. I want to take your pain. I want to share your pain. And that's empathy. That is empathy. So it's really beautiful. But some of the, again, reports say that she became, and I, it's just to imagine this happening to her is really difficult. She became so sick, her hair fell out. So during this time, you know, the Prophet, said, again, he's, he has, to, he has to maintain his place as the messenger of Allah. There are a lot of repercussions to a situation like this. He cannot bypass his role as the messenger of Allah and then just tend to his own heart. It's a huge inner conflict happening, right? He knows who she is. He loves her. He can't handle that these things are being said about her. But at the same time, there's just too many ramifications that he has to think about. So he starts to, again, uh, he comes in the room with her at one point, and he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Amma ba. this is all mentioned in the report from Sayyid Aisha. And then he begins to console her in a way that is very, again, neutral. He says, if you're innocent, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will vindicate you. But if you've done anything wrong, make tawbah. He's trying to give her a nasiha. And she's just, like, stunned. Because from her angle, you actually think this is true, or maybe you think it's true. Her heart just cannot handle the idea that there would be even a little tiny Adam's weight of doubt in his heart that she just looks to her parents and is like, because you know, this is she's with her parents at this point. Like, can you please answer him? She asked her mother, and they're just like. We have no idea what to say. This is the messenger of Allah. How can we possibly respond to him at, in the term, in, in the sense of like, you know, advocating against him in a way? That's what she was seeking. Like, be my advocate. So her mother's like, I don't know what to say. And then she turns to her father. I don't know what to say. Both of them completely silenced by this situation. And at that point, she, in, in, her, in the narration, it's really beautiful. She's, again, so overwhelmed by emotions that she's, she has, she, she's a half of that, you know, at a certain point she completed her hips. She had this sort of Yusuf memorized. She couldn't remember Sina Yaqub's name, so she called him Abu Yusuf. And she said, then all I can do is say what Abu Yusuf said, Right? which is, فسبر, uh, uh, sorry, فَسَبُّرْ جَمِيلًا وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانْ عَلَى مَا تَصْبِقُونَ So patience is most fitting, and Allah is the one who sought help, for, help against that which you describe. And, and, you know, she says later in the uh, narration that she was memorizing, she knew it, but she just couldn't even think of Yaqub alayhi name, so she just called him Abu Yusuf. Just to show you her state, like her mind is just all over the place, because she can't believe that she has to say this, but subhanAllah, she had the most perfect response, right? And at that point, 
if you go to the next slide, she says, after saying this, I turned my face. So she actually was laying in bed because she's still sick. She says these words. Her mother, her father, and her husband are standing there, all of them watching this unfold, the scene unfold, where she says these words and then turns her back to all of them. It was not, this was not a, an act of any, like, we, we don't look at that and say, oh, that was disrespectful. No, never should we ever speak of our, uh, you know, of our, of our mother in this way. What she was doing was basically drawing a line that I need Allah and Allah only right now in this moment. Right? I, that's all. I, I just need my Lord. So that was her way of doing that by turning her heart away from them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are her words. She says, I knew Allah would eventually reveal my chastity, honesty, perhaps maybe through the dream, a dream of the Prophet ﷺ. She knew. She has full confidence that Allah is going to vindicate her. But she said, I never in my wildest dream thought that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal Qur'an to vindicate me. SubhanAllah. This is our Lord. Because she completely surrendered to him and called on him. You, this is you and me at this point. And right then and there, remember when the Prophet said received revelation, the signs were very obvious. This weight would overcome him. Beads of sweat would form on his forehead. You could tell what was happening if you were there with him. So the, in the moment, in that moment that she's just like, I have nobody but Allah. The revelation descends. And immediately the Prophet وسلم, you know, recites, there's two and a half pages of Surah An-Nur are to vindicate her from all of what was said about her. And he's overjoyed. Everybody's overjoyed. And her mother just says, thank the Prophet وسلم. And again, because she had her own relationship with her Lord. And this was a huge proof of that. There was other proof, obviously. But when her mother says to thank the Prophet Sallallahu she says, No, wallahi, I will, not stand, thank, I will not stand up for him or thank him. I will thank Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala for revealing the, this, these verses for me. So she was, again, reiterating her uh, you know, conviction and her relationship with her Lord in, in this moment, SubhanAllah. Again, the story is just so multi-layered, so powerful. I'm giving you the best summary that I could come up with. But the lessons that we learn from this, there are books written about this hadith al-ifq. Some of the scholars say there are over 80 or more specific lessons that you can get from this story. So I've just compiled a few just so that we understand, again, how much this incident, although it seems so like horrific on one hand, like, oh, why, you know, sometimes we don't understand things. I was like, why did she have to endure that? But then on the other hand, when you see from, you know, a societal perspective, right, because we, we have to, you know, interact with each other as human beings, there are things that are, events that are going to happen throughout, you know, the world that need, con that need you know, a way to, uh, to, 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 to process them or deal with them. And sometimes examples like this can can apply to so many, right? So here we have from this uh, story, fiqh related to women, fiqh related to dealing with non-mahram, adab between the spouses, between children and parents, adab of receiving news and information, adab of giving nasiha, of investigating affairs, right? Because there are things, you know, come up. There, there are steps to this, guarding the tongue against backbiting, the evils of suspicion, spying, curiosity, the process of repentance, the rights due to other Muslims and the significance of what really tawakkal and surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means. So this is, and much, much more. This is just, again, a short list. But I wanted to take a moment to highlight specific things on a practical level that I think all of us can take from this story. First and foremost, this is a hadith everybody should memorize. If you don't know it, please make it your goal to memorize it. Take out your phone, take a snapshot, a snapshot of the slide. Feel free to do that for all the slides. But memorize this hadith and live by this hadith. Inshallah, you will have success. Min husni islam al-mar'i tarkuhu ma la ya'ni. Beautiful, super short, concise, 
powerful. Beautiful Islam entails minding one's own business. Imagine how much healthier our society and our world would be if everybody minded their own business, stayed in their own lane. When you hear about someone going through something, whether it's a marital issue or a ch problem with their children, don't inquire. It's not your business. You don't have the right to know people's private information. And don't delude yourself to be like, oh, I'm concerned. If you're concerned, go to the prayer room. Go make dua. Go, go, go give sadaqah on their behalf. But you wanting to know the details just speaks to you wanting to in, in, inject yourself in another person's life for whatever reason. But it's not our way. We mind our own business. Very important. Another one. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالظَّنَّ فَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ أَكْذَبُ الْحَدِيثِ Another uh, very important rule to live by. Beware of suspicion, for it is the most deceitful of thought. Don't become a suspicious person. And we live in the age of social media where a lot of private information is shared or implied or somehow alluded to. And so sometimes you go down a rabbit's hole because you want to know, ooh, someone went on a vacation. Hmm, I wonder where, right? Let me go down and check their Instagram stories and their, their, you know, their posts and see if they've shared something. Why? Did you mind your own business? <laughs> no. And now you're suspicious because you want to know ooh, who went with them. Where did they go? How? What, it's just all a waste of your time, right? And this is how shaitan uses our, our uh, vulnerabilities against us. The next one. أَكْثَرُ خَطَايَا إِبْنِ آدَمْ فِي the majority of man's sins emanate from his tongue. We know from this hadith and others that the two reasons why more people are in hellfire are because of what they do between their lips and in their, with their private parts. That is a hadith. So we have to take our words seriously, right? What we say, how we say it, what we don't say, all of that can be applied. But in this case, sinfulness that emanates from the tongue it's one of the inroads of the tongue we have to be very very watchful over that and that's why i just uh, spoke to I, I teach so alhamdulillah i was with a group of students um these past few days and we've been talking about preparation for ramadan and one of the advice i have for myself and for all of us inshallah is to really try to practice more silence um in as much as you can like really make it a goal. Like I'm just going to try to take a vow of silence. You know, the Buddhists and other people do this as a spiritual practice. But imagine if we did that, because when you do that, you actually start to pay attention to your thoughts. And when you pay attention to your thoughts, then you'll be like, whoa, this is what I end up thinking about all the time? What a waste of time. And inshallah, it'll change from there. This is another very powerful hadith. A person has done enough wrong in his life if he simply repeats everything he hears. We have to have a better system of vetting information. You know, again, just because someone says something, always ask. I mean, when it comes to religious knowledge, you should always ask for citations. That's why Alhamdulillah, my teacher and our teachers always taught us, cite your sources. Don't just speak from yourself. Sometimes people speak from themselves. And we live in an age of social media where there are a lot of people who presume to have knowledge and presume to be authorities on religion, literally speaking from their nafs. There's no valid proofs that they use. They just have opinions to share. There are a lot of opinions that are shared and they're packaged as nasiha, you know, counsel, it's good advice. But if they don't cite their sources and they don't give credible you know, explanation of what they're coming from. Just know that it's from their nafs. And then if you repeat that to other people, guess what you're doing? You're contributing to the spread of misinformation. So you want to be very careful to make sure that when people speak, hmm, who are their teachers? Where did they learn from? What are their citations? Like what sources are they learning from? All of this will help you. But in the broader scheme, just in general, don't just repeat things because you hear them. You know, be mindful. And then, لا يدخل الجنة قاتت, right? The talebearer will not enter paradise. And the gossip monger will not enter paradise. Very important reminders for all of us. If we engage in these types of things, we are literally barring ourselves from, uh, from paradise. So who would do that willingly and knowingly? Well, these warnings are given to us so that we catch ourselves and that we make better choices and decisions, right? And I have, um, sorry, I'm just going to pull up something quickly on my notes here because related to this particular one, if you give me a moment. Uh, 
this is uh, in this context. Um, so it's mentioned that one day that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari's wife came home and said to him, this is actually related to, this, to the hadith al-Ifq, have you heard? And she did not even mention the slander, but Abu Ayyub became angry and said, how can we speak about such a thing? Glory be to you, our Lord, this is heinous slander. So because he had this beautiful reaction, like how could we even think this and how could we spread this? There was no main, names mentioned, nothing, right? Allah revealed in Surah An-Nur, quoting Abu Ayyub al-Ansari as a good example, even though he said this in the privacy of his house, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually repeated the same words that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said. He said, if only you had said upon hearing it, the slander, how can we speak about such a thing? Glory be to you, this is a heinous slander. So subhanAllah, having that beautiful fitra reaction when you see something ugly and wrong and, and you know restoring what is haq, what is true, this virtuous act got Abu Ayyub al-Ansari mentioned or, you know, in the tafsir, in the Qur'an, Allahu Akbar. And this shows us all that, just because, this is a really important point, this is why I wanted to share it. These are, by the way, the notes uh, that um, Sheikh uh, Yasser al-Qadi in his commentary on Hadith al-Ifq mentioned. So these are his, um, uh, his uh, observations, but I thought it was so powerful because I run into this a lot. This shows us that just because we're married to somebody doesn't mean we will get away with riba, right? Um, even between husband and wife, we're not allowed to do riba and namima. This is a real serious problem in our community. There are sisters, and I, this is why I caution sisters, please be very careful who you take as a confidant, because I guarantee you, if you have a sister who has, doesn't understand this, her husband knows all your business. Because there are some women, that's what they do. They get in the car, oh my God, you won't believe what so-and-so told me. And you're like, what? You're sharing other people's private marital or fam familial problems when they came in to confide in you with your husband. Why? Because he gets a pass card. Like he gets a card that just says, sure, whatever I know, he knows. Audhu billah. Al-majalis, al-amana. If someone is speaking to you privately. And by the way, our teacher taught us, and I, you know, we have, mashallah, Sada Fadwa here and others who know this. He, they, you know, they would actually demonstrate. So they would, they would show us. For example, if you're speaking to someone, and I'll show you. He's, he's, this is Sheikh Hamza. He said, if you're speaking to someone in a private conversation, Mr. Saba, maybe we can model this for our audience here. You're speaking, and the person does this. Okay. Okay. What are they telling you? It's private. That immediately makes that conversation an amana, and you cannot say a single thing. They don't have to give you a disclaimer that please don't share this with anybody. It's implied by ishara. The ishara is, I am looking out to see if there's an eavesdropper nearby. If that doesn't tell you this is private, you need someone to actually have a contract with you, like non-disclosure form, give me a break. We're Muslim, we should fear Allah. So this applies to your spouses as well. Please, we have to remember this, and also tell our husbands the same. If we go to the next slide, uh, Bismillah, again, there's so much to say about Sayyidah Aisha and the lessons, the le there's so many lessons, but let's just quickly look at her legacy. Inshallah, oh, Jazakallah khair. How much time is that? Mm -hmm. 10 more minutes, okay, 10 more minutes, Bismillah. Okay, so if we go to the slide that says legacy, um, just so that we understand, again, who she is, Ya Allah. She's, of course, the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umm Rahman radiallahu anhuma. She was born and raised in a Muslim home, visited often by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi So before their marriage, the Prophet sallallahu was always, because it's Abu Bakr, his best friend. So she was in his orbit, and she came, She was all, her parents were already Muslim when she was born. So she never had, like many of the other Sahaba, a period where there was, you know, they were in Jahriya, never had that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi dreamt of her, right, wrapped in a green silk, which we mentioned. She was the only wife who was never married before. The Prophet ﷺ received direct revelation directly about her, right? And then he also passed away, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in her house, in her arms. SubhanAllah, so beautiful. She was a hafid of Quran. She narrated 2,210 hadith. She was a public speaker, a teacher, jurist, etc., and political consultant and military strategist for the Khulafa. She went on to live to 64 year, years old, and her brilliant memory is, to this day, there's still people who, when they learn of her, whether they're Muslim or otherwise, they're shocked at, at what she was able to produce 
And that's, you know, one of the great wisdoms of her marriage to the Prophet Sallallahu If we go to the next slide, these are quotes about her. As Zubaydi said that if we compared Aisha's knowledge to all women, all women, that means all of us and everybody else in existence, Aisha would surpass them. That's how brilliant she was, subhanAllah. And then this is another beautiful quote. I have never seen anyone who could have knowledge of an ayah, an obligatory act, a sunnah act, poetry, history, lineage, judgment, or medicine better than Aisha radiallahu anha. I once asked her, okay, like he understood a lot of the religious stuff, but he was puzzled by medicine. Like medicine too? <laughs> is there any subject that you haven't mastered? Um, how did you learn it? Uh, aunt, and she answered, when I was sick, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would prescribe treatments for me as did as he did when the people became ill. I also learned from the people prescribing the treatment to each other. So she was always a learner. And this is also another really important part of her life that all of us can, she was a lifelong learner. She didn't just stop learning. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm not a student anymore because I'm a mom, as if you've changed you know, direction and now you don't need to learn. This is uh, obviously wrong. We should all be in the pursuit of knowledge until we take our last breath. Um, and actually just uh, it occurred to me right now, I was uh, recently at a talk with Sheikh Yahya Rodas, and he's shared a beautiful story. I think it was Abu Dhar uh, who said that, um, he said that, it's a quote from him, he said that if I was being, like if he was to be executed and, you know, with a, with a sword over his neck, and he said, between the time that the sword was lifted and brought down to my neck, if I had the opportunity within those seconds to teach something from the Prophet I would do it. I was just blown away by that. Like how incredible were these people that were in the Prophet's company. They loved Islam and they loved to teach Islam. So we take these lessons, but she was a lifelong learner. And I'm going to leave you before uh, the, I hear the iqama with something that, again, Allah, you know, if you know me, if you follow me on, on Facebook, especially when I used to write long form posts, you may recall one of my genres was, uh, well, I did the Trader Joe's ones. I don't know if you guys know those. Those are popular. And then I did another one that, that with the hashtag, no coincidences, because I don't believe there's ever coincidences. So I'm preparing for this talk, you know, over the past few weeks, and my, one of my dearest friends, she randomly at Fudger sends me a picture and I'm like, what's this? Uh, just like two days ago. And I look and I just was like, Allahu Akbar. Wow, wow, wow. And I, I just was like, I knew this was from Allah. So I wanted to share this with you because this, the next, the very last slide here, this is, comes from Sheikh Muhammad Said Ramadan al Buti, said that when he read how much the Orientalists, writers, and the enemies of the religion were attacking our mother, Sayyida Aisha, he decided to write a book in her defense which spoke about her blessed life. Now his daughter was living in Riyadh at the time and she had no idea about the book that her father was authoring. No idea. She tearfully rang the sheikh one day and said, last night I saw a dream that a lady walked into my room and said, I am the mother of the believers, Aisha. And I have come because I want to thank your father for the book he has authored in my defense. The Sheikh would burst out into tears when narrating this story. May Allah continue to honor and raise our noble mother, Lady Aisha radiallahu anha, even in the barzakh, she's behind the barrier. She didn't go to the author. She went to his daughter. Allahu Akbar, these are real experiences, these are real things that happen, and it just as a testimony of her greatness, subhanAllah, so we should love her, we should try our best to emulate her in every way, which is a tall order, but we should absolutely know her, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, increases our love for her, and that we get all the opportunity to meet her, and to kiss her hands, and to, to thank her. Jazakumullah khairan, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.